Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Drawing Room. I'm Kate McFarlane, co-director of Drawing Room. Um, and I welcome you to this event. Um, deficiency evolved through exchanges between um, the curator Ulrich Locke and the artist Luke Toymans around the work of Andre Roblowski, who died at the age of 30 in 1957. Acknowledged as one of the most significant Polish artists of the post-war era, Roblowski is little known in the UK. Placing a selection of works on paper alongside those by René Daniels and Luke Toymans, artists with very strong reputations in, the country, in this country, is an, is an effective way to bring attention to the innovative and provocative work of the Polish artist. Ulrich and Luke um, each discovered the work of Roblowski in the early 90s, and tonight's conversation will address their shared passion for his work, the evolution of the exhibition, and the role that drawing plays in each of the artist's practice. So I take pleasure in introducing our speakers tonight. Ulrich Locke, here on my right. He's a lecturer, curator, and critic based in Berlin. He was director of the Kunstholm Bern from 1985, then director of the Kunstmuseum Lucerne, and then deputy director of the new Theodor de Soraves in Porto, Portugal. In these roles, he organized several exhibitions featuring works by René Daniels and Luc Toymans. And in 2012 and 2013, he participated in international seminars at the Warsaw Museum of Modern Art devoted to the work of Andrzej Roblewski. Luc Toymans has exhibited internationally since the early 1990s and in 2001 represented Belgium in the 49th Venice Biennale. In 2013, a solo presentation of the artist's portraits was held at the Menel Collection in Houston, Texas. And he has a forthcoming exhibition at the Talbot Rice Gallery at the University of Edinburgh in the autumn of 2015. Toymans was the curator of the 2013 exhibition Constable Delacroix, Friedrich and Goya, A Shock to the Senses at Elbertinum in Dresden. And he previously organized a vision of Central Europe in 2010 at Bruges Centrale in Belgium, um, as well as the State of the Things, Brussels, Beijing in 2009 at Palais de Beaux Arts in Brussels, which traveled to the National Art Museum of China, Beijing. Um, so I'd like th to leave them to their conversation. Um, I'd like to request that everybody turns off their mobile phones. Um, they'll be um, having a conversation for around 45 minutes and then we'll invite questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Uh, it's great to be here again. Uh, we were here yesterday, now uh, in a different setting, let's say. I'm really touched to see all of you. Uh, a heartfelt welcome. Uh, you know, arriving here for the first time, one has the impression that it's really far away and nobody is going to find their way. Um, I'm really happy to see that that is obviously not true. Uh, we have not talked uh, about what we are going to do. Luke and I, uh, I have some questions. Um, maybe Luke has some questions. And maybe you have some questions and uh, also comments. And I think if it's really urgent, you may, uh, you may just interrupt and intervene. And if it's not so urgent, um, uh, Shut after, up. after yeah, this three quarter weird. hour, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I would uh, like to take the opportunity, uh, Luke, to ask you, uh, to ask you something, mm -hmm. which is, I, you have criticized me talking about the trauma Mm -hmm. You said, uh, uh, this curator, he talks too much about the trauma. Uh, what is the issue here? Well, it's, it's probably German, Ulrich. I mean, uh, as you come out of an elliptical country, it is that. But the thing is just that I think it's interesting to talk about uh, the lesser known artist in this constellation, which is Rublevsky, which I saw in 1993 when I did my first show in Poland in, uh, I, I visited Poland in, when I was 22 or 23. I did all the countries in the Comic-Con, you know, constellation, which was still the, under the 
involved of the Soviet Union. And, but in 1993, I did my first show in the Fox style, which is a very uh, renowned uh, institution, actually, which was run down by Wislav Morowski, now by Andres, who was, 24, was then 24 and now changed, ultimately, into something else, I suppose. But I, at that point, I saw a show, uh, Ander Rotenberg was still the director of the Sagenta, the National Gallery in Warsaw. Ofro Bleskin was blown away by it blown away by it because of the inertia of the imagery. The imagery that was uh, empowering to me in the sense that it was, on the one hand, dramatic, and that's where we talk about the trauma. I'm trying to explain it now, back to you. And on the other hand, imminent, which was something very weird for me. So coming back to my country, I said to Jan Hout, who was then still alive, although this artist is dead, you should do a show with him because it's really important. I think it's interesting because Rublevsky is a very difficult person to pin down. Now, uh, having had the opportunity to, to sit on a terrace here in the neighborhood and talk to the natives, I actually came up with an idea that if you would think of a novel for Rublevsky, what would you think? And I would actually uh, come to the long goodbye of very awkward of Raymond Chandler. But uh, I think it's quite uh, thought worthy, the long goodbye. Um, I think you and I, we, uh, we were, I mean, let's say we, we, um, Oh, we uh, confronted or we, we, we found out about Rublevsky more or less at the same time. And I remember that I uh, more uh, sort of resented, <coughs> resented the work. I, I said to, to my friends there in, in Warsaw, yes, but what is it exactly that you find so important in Rublevsky? And I had more doubts. Uh, and then they invited me exactly for the seminary because they <laughs> were interested in <laughs> inviting somebody who didn't like the work, which I find quite interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is it exactly, what, is so, what made, made it for you so important, this work of Rublevsky? Well, on the one hand, I think it's, uh, apart from the imminent idea of the disillusion, because there is all this sort of speculation that since the guy had epilepsy and he did this walk in the mountains so it was like bound to happen he would f fall off a, a rock or something like that which uh, to me sounds a little bit pathetic but on the other hand uh, I think what's really important for me is, is, is the element of the void in the work which is something I've seen also in and there are three works here in the back space the one with the house with the light on it the boat and it reminds me of Leon Spilliard in a very weird way, which is somebody you probably don't know. But, uh, uh, he was a contemporary of James Ensor and is a great artist, was an autodidact and should be shown. Maybe it will happen one day. And so th that was a reminiscence in the element of the loner, basically. That was uh, what interested me the most uh, and, and, and gave me the shock when I saw that work. Uh, there's something uh, in, 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 in earlier conversation, you, you mentioned something else as well in relation to Wroblewski, uh, which is that you were somehow touched or moved or whatever uh, by, uh, by, uh, by, by the fact that you noticed the color blue. Yeah, the blue color is also something preeminent in, in the entirety of the work. It's a sort of like retrieved notion not only of space, but also within the element of what figuration would be. And of course, there are these abstract images that he made, or constellations, and there's this show going on right now, or maybe it's finished, I don't know, in, in Warsaw, where Eric de Chassy, who was French, adamantly, actually made a whole point about the fact that he used the back and the front of the painting, which I prob he probably did that because of, uh, as I also did, and many other artists did because of a lack of money. But he made a whole concept out of it. But then again, the French never understood globalization. So. <laughs> but the thing is just that uh, 
I think it's, uh, yeah, the, the, the blue is, is a predominant aspect in the work. It's, it's, uh, it's a color at the one hand that gives space and takes it away at the same time. So there is an inert version in the work that I quite like. And it's not to use the word statuesque, but it has something to do with that. Um, there's, uh, I don't remember exactly what it is, but in, in German art historical literature or art uh, theoretical literature, there's something about the color blue, the blue problem in painting of modernism or something, very strange. Interesting, probably, ch to check out. They talk about uh, uh, Cezanne, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. Okay, now you with the color blue, I mean, I remember probably one or, of our very first conversations back in the beginning of the 90s, you were already talking about blue, and talking about blue as something that was important for you as a, as a very young artist, even as a student. What, what is that? And, and recently... No, uh, it, it, was, uh, it was actually very simple, I mean, uh, when I uh, was working in the beginning, I worked a lot at night and uh, with light bulbs, which were yellow, yellow. So it's like cybernetics. You sort of steer against it and then you go much more into the blue. If you look at the work of Edward Hopper, which made mostly the first batch of it, was made also at night because he was working as an illustrator during the day, you could see that all these works are blue. I mean, that's, that's an interesting point. Uh, later on, in, I had the luxury to work with daylight, <laughs> <laughs> which is the best light, basically. And then it stopped with the blue for you. But it's, it's changed. True. It's I, cha I, it, no, it, it, drast it, dra it, it drastically changed. It drastically changed. It's true. I remember you were talking about your last show at, at, uh, at uh, David Zwirner and about the, uh, the portraits that you did after, after the... Uh, the portraits Scottish of painting. Rayburn, yeah, hmm? yeah. Rayburn. And also there you were talking about blue. There was something, I remember you were saying that there was some blue coming in and you were extremely interested in that. So it seems to be recurrent or it seems to be almost like a red yeah, but, but that, that, that was just because of the, the fact that I printed out these enlargement uh, enlarged images of the faces of these portraits and they come out of the print of blue. So white turns into blue. So it gives you, by doing that, and this is another thing which will rescue that I sort of also uh, immediately recognized that the fine line between what figuration is and abstraction is, and then in his sense even more complicated in a political sense because first of all, there, of course, is a trauma with the Second World War, but then there was the expectation of a new era, which was totally, completely destroyed after the death of Stalin and all the scandals that came out, and the atrocities that came out. And so this fine line between that element of figuration and abstraction, which is quite interesting because, I mean, there are beautiful works like the one greens you see over there, but you see that even there, the color is muted. Mm -hmm. And that was also a, a, a question for me because I, I sort of also do that in the sense that for me, the idea of tonality is also space. I mean, if you look at the work of Elsa Kelly, you see, a fant which is a fantastic painter, which I really Who's like. Who's that? Elthworth. Elthworth Elthworth Kelly. Kelly. But you see the element of abstraction in terms of a sculptural thing. Now, besides the idea of perspective, there is also an element of a painterly depth, and the painterly depth is actually within the tonality. In that sense, maybe we, as Belgians, being a small country, could have a sort of, well, there, there could be a link with Eastern Europe in that sense. Well, talking about Belgium, uh, there's a work by uh, Thomas Schütte that he did uh, after staying in uh, Ostende in this amazing uh, hotel, the Tame mm -hmm. Palace, and it's called Belgian Blues. Mm -hmm. And um, just uh, mentioning the, uh, this hotel, it's also connected, and this is not prepared now, it's connected to your own history as a painter. Mm -hmm. 
uh, you made your first show. No, I did my first show. Uh, actually, it was a show that was be sent out to do to get with another artist to barge out because they were not. We sent out 5,000 invitations and nobody actually for sort of reply. And he just barged out, and I just said, I just want to see my work out of my studio. And my mother came, went into the empty, it was in an empty swimming pool. On the ledges we put the work, I put the work. And my, my, my mother went into the swimming pool and cried. And, and there were some friends. But and at the, when the night was falling, I was looking at it from the balcony, and I said, it's good, it's going to be fine. This is like the first time I saw the work out of the studio. And it was correct. So it's okay. And you have to know that my mother's uh, minority complex does not fit this entire region, basically. So. Uh, now that you're uh, mentioning your mother, uh, it takes us sort of away, uh, so, sort of like uh, back to this idea of the trauma. Because as far as I understand, in your family there is something. I mean, what is a trauma? A trauma is a wound. It's, it's just the translation of wound, right? And it's a, it's a split, it's a cut, it's a rift, it's a rupture. And uh, in psychological terms, uh, somebody who has experienced a trauma, they, um, they sort of work around it, and that's what we call a neurosis. A neurosis is a way that somebody develops in order to be able to live with a wound, a trauma. And uh, so that I find interesting because uh, these, these uh, paintings, especially Wroblewski, but in some ways also uh, Luc Teumann's work and Daniel's. And René. Yeah. And René, exactly. I mean, they are, they, are, um, <coughs> they are traversed, let's say, by ruptures. And that's where I see the expression of a trauma. So, so the interesting thing is, Ulrich, that during, this is the second time we do the show in a sort of concise version. In Poznan it was three levels, so it was a bit bigger. I think we made a good selection to begin with, so thank you for that. And, but what's interesting is that you see these parallels. Uh, if you look at the oldest work I have in the show is the one with the frame that I designed myself, like the 18th hole of the golf, co golf course. And it, it's uh, from the time, from the end of the 70s, we That's itself, 78. Right? Not, not later. And if you look at René, you know, with this sort of lost space, the element of the bow tie, the, the compulsiveness of that, the, the cut upness of the fish, there, is, there are all these resemblance uh, between, between the, the, the pictorial of what you actually can see. And that is amazing because, I mean, it goes over time and through time. So that, that means that there's something going on which is like something like an undercurrent. I think it's really important and therefore very happy to do the show in London, which is uh, renowned for being a little bit one-on-one -on -one to begin with. And so... <coughs> Bringing in Eastern Europe, like Eastern European promises, by the way, <laughs> is quite a nice asset to it. Because that is exactly what it's about. It's about a interesting diversion, which is also a little bit coinciding with the show as an idea. What actually uh, can, we, can we think or say about that kind of curating or that kind of uh, putting together a show? Uh, I mean, there's no theory with this show. There's, no, no. Re there's really no justification. I mean, there's, there's bits of theory, <coughs> definitely, but uh, when you start to develop it, you will also be forced to um, take it back and to try to go another way. I mean, uh, is that a serious way of, of, of curating at uh, all? Like the first, like the wall that is this sort of like inverted stern wall of the, here in the space, with the work of Roblewski, my work, and Renee's work. It's quite exempl exemplary for what the show stands, basically. There's something really crazy. I mean, uh, I, if you have not seen it, you should, when walking out, you should uh, give it a look and a thought. You see at the right side a, uh, a uh, drawing of uh, René Daniels that uh, shows the artist, let's say, 
who is not the fine artist, but more like the magician, the artist of the circus, the illusionist. Look at the configuration, and then look at the configuration of one of the people in the, uh, in the drawing uh, from 1948 or 49 of Wroblewski, which is depicting an execution. And you will see exactly the same configuration. And that is totally crazy. I mean, this is really shocking. Because uh, obviously there's no relation. I mean, Rene, when he did that, he did not know about uh, Wroblewski, not at all. I don't know. I, I, I don't know what to say about that. Is it a, a sort of like archetype? I don't really think so. Maybe it's just chance, or maybe the I don't know. I really do not know. Maybe you have an idea. <clears throat> but the interesting thing I would say with that kind of, you know, almost irresponsible curating, you give the you 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 yeah you open you open ways for for meaning that is completely that is absolutely not predetermined. It's not deliberate. It, it appears, and then you have to start to read it. And then you have to do your work, really your homework, and see if it is sustainable, if it's not sustainable, if you can uh, support it with other observations, etc., etc. What do you think? Do you think this is, how, how do you explain something like this recurrence? I mean, not at the same time, in a, comp in a quite different uh, context. How, how does that kind of stuff happen? Well, I think it's, uh, due to literature in a very weird way, and the idea of dissolution, which is <laughs> something that the three artists actually share in a very weird way, in a different way, historically in a different way, because one is dead, the other one is somewhat disabled, and uh, which I'm not. So <laughs> the thing is just that. That is what is a continuous line in terms of what uh, the idea of skepticism could be in, uh, as a visual. And I think that, it, that that's really important to keep because it's a little bit like Sparrow Agner once said, that it's not exactly what I say, it's what I mean. <laughs> so it's, it's a little uh -huh. bit the other way around. And I think these, these coincidences happen much more in life than you can actually imagine. So it doesn't really come as a shock. I think it's actually beautiful, basically. Maybe it, 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 it is actually maybe a way to uh, sort of like, uh, if you have to make a connotation of what beauty could be, that might be it. Like that sort of like stupid coincidence. Which is, on the one hand, stupid, but on the other hand, terrible, because... Uh, yeah, but it's, it's a little bit like, how, how could you be cruel, you know? Like right. You could be cruel by being right. very tender, right? Right. There's other instances of that kind. Uh, for instance, there's uh, this painting that uh, Luke uh, already mentioned, um, maybe the, of you, the, the, the oldest painting in the, in the uh, work, in the show from mm. of, uh, 76, I think, the, the naval officer mm. with which one entrance to the uh, show starts. Um, he has, I mean, he bows down and uh, shows his cap, his mm. uh, uniform cap, which appears as a uh, whole, visually as a whole. And when installing the show in, in Poznan, you made a big uh, point out of juxtaposing it to these exactly works of uh, Wroblewski, yeah. abstract works, you know, yeah. because you saw something similar somehow. And uh, I don't know, I mean, I, I have a sort of serious formation and um, I don't really think we would do that in my science, uh, art history or art theory. Um, but it is a generative, I mean, it produces something, I would say, unexpected meaning. I think also it's important to, uh, whenever you show work, you should activate it. And, and I mean, if ever the sense of uh, the idea of a museum would be like, sort of like, the museum is not so much the idea of being actually there. It's about the, the sort of like, not the memory, but it's about the brain in a sense. And it's, uh, 
the element of reconsidering things. That is actually what one should do. And in this sense, since we are working with somebody like Rubleski who is no longer there, this makes it all the more poignant. You know, you're, you're, you're mentioning the, the, the museum, and I would say the work of René Daniels um, comes out of a deep, and not a personal, uh, but a, uh, uh, a super personal disappointment with the museum. You know, I mean, what he does at one point, and uh, on the other side here, we have a couple of uh, examples of that. He paints the museum space, the gallery space, with paintings, and each one of these paintings is, is empty. Which means, at the end of the day, that uh, his own paintings also would be empty. So, I think what he does is that he uses René Daniels' uh, representation in order to show that there is nothing to represent. Yeah, but, but, but what's even more interesting is actually the fact that, in a very weird way, all this is brought back, and that's why I said the long goodbye of Raymond Chandler in a very sort of sordid point. It's all about the idea of legacy. What is the legacy of things? I mean, what would be the legacy of a contemporary artist right now within this and 30, 40 years? I wonder. It's an interesting point. I mean, looking at a world that's changing. It will not be the same as how we see Velázquez or Manet or Cézanne, in, for that matter. It will be something totally different. And that is exactly where the element of disappointment or dissolution in terms of, I mean, prematurely nearly, with Rublevsky comes in. I'm right. right, sitting right in front of his portrait here. So that is, that is actually interesting. I think in, in, in all this, this discussion in terms of what one could exoticize or not, it is much more interesting what you can actually keep. It's going to be difficult, you know? Uh, yes, and, uh, and uh, I, I would say that um, an artist, although the disappointment, although the trauma, doesn't develop a neurosis, but develops artwork, artwork beauty, 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 even. And, and we can, we can see, see it, it in, in René Daniels exactly with these, uh, with these um, accumulations of, of black shapes over there. Yeah, the you know, the because here he, he, he <coughs> I mean, he starts to, to paint these, he discovers that the museum, that the gallery is a deadening apparatus, and he is disappointed. He paints this thing uh, for two years, and then he starts to make something different out of it. And maybe that is what you're talking about. That's the legacy. No, that's no, the key well, it's stuff. worse than that, Ulrich. I think it's basically the element of uh, not so much that things are dated or predated. It is worse than that. It's a very, um, I'm just curious. This is just my inquest. And that's also my interest in this, this type of show. I mean, this type of juxtaposition in terms of what meaningfulness or the signifier could still be. Uh, the point is, does somebody care? I'm not really sure. So, I mean, you have to live in a world that you have to accept, and internet is a very big, basic element into that. Or Wikipedia, where people then actually really believe that Einstein was born in 1978. So, uh, or Winston Churchill was a knight of the round tables or whatever. So it is just that there is this growing element of uh, not only ignorance, but real stupidity, which is physically felt. So who cares? This is a point. This is a very important point. You have an imminent question. The question is, what about memory? Memory. memory. But can you make it into a question? Uh, I mean, what about, how can one answer? Um, synchronicity, space, choice of image. Synchronicity, space, choice of image. Synchronicity. It's not sobriety, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, never mind. 
Well, I think memory is something which is totally inadequate to begin with, which is interesting. That's why memory exists. This, you cannot memorize anything fully, which is good as it goes, because it makes inconsistencies. If we would memorize everything consistently, we would not need the visual at all, basically. So this is a compulsive act against losing your memory to a point. I personally think that uh, memory is a little bit uh, overestimated in contemporary discourse. But uh, it brings me to another question for, for Luc Thurmans. Uh, maybe we could move to uh, one single work in this show that somehow uh, doesn't fit the frame, mm -hmm. which is the wall painting. And, uh, well, my closest friends have sort of criticized me because I said I did it in two and a half hours, and they said, sure you did. <laughs> but anyway, so the wall painting is in a way similar to what we did in Poznan. There was first the idea in Poznan to take one wall to do the wall drawing it's with chalk. And, but then in the course of installing the show, I talked to Ulrich and I said, maybe it's better to make it part of the show. It's more interesting. Which we also did here. Uh, unlike in Poznan, where the wall actually sort of uh, worked together with the wall painting, because we, I used the gray and actually instigated the image that I was going to make there, it is different here. And it's based upon a Xerox that I've made in preparation of a drawing show in 1997, the first drawing show actually, in the Kunstmuseum in Bern with Joseph Herbenstein, in which you see three images, three separate drawings actually brought together. And I thought it would be nice to make this sort of combination in terms of a show, it's like a mini show on a wide uh, form, so to speak. Uh, the element of, 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 of doing that is uh, giving a sort of, a sort of other imminence to, to, to the show because it's also a different juxtaposition. And I think that makes it uh, like always different, always dissimilar to what it could actually be. Because you come to the space and then you decide not only that but also the size of how big it will be. I think one of the interesting things in the wall drawing is that it is the most recent work in the show. It's almost synch synchronous. It was done two days, two days ago. Yeah. On Monday, on Monday, on Monday, three days. So in a sort of way, in one way, I think this work uh, does break this uh, fascination with memory. It does something, I mean, any show is, has to do with memory, right? You, you put things together that have been done before, and the museum is the mausoleum, as Adorno says. It's the place of memory, it's the monument, etc., etc. And here, in some sort of way, uh, with this <laughs> almost actuality, you know, it's almost, almost now that it's been produced, you're breaking this sort of fixation to memory. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's full of memory because it is. What, it, what is it? It's, it's the reproduction of reproductions of reproductions. I mean, at least three levels of reproduction, you know, so there's a lot of memory inside, I would say, layering of uh, time layering, you know, time layering, and it's completely synchronous, no, contemporary. But, uh, the, the, the other thing which is important is that drawings are quite dissimilar to, let's say, a painting or any other artwork. They're very particular in their execution and in terms that they are, in that point, not really random. They're very decisive. It is very difficult to change the drawing. Uh, if you do a watercolor and you make a mistake, you can see the mistake. Uh, with an oil painting, you could, might want to match it up and overpaint it, but it's a different process. So. That's why I'm also very glad that there is nothing else that works on paper in this show, which is quite decisive. And a lot of people 
do not really understand the particularity of exactly that specific type of work and that specific type of sensitivity, that specific type of interest, which has the element of intimacy and at the same time the element of being very decisive, which I find quite interesting because it comes very close to what your handwriting could be about. These, not, not in terms of calligraphy, but in terms of what your compulsiveness of just being there physically and making a trace, which I think is really important in this whole story. And so maybe, therefore, if you, if you, as if you pointed out all the similarities, of course there will be similarities. But I mean, it, the beauty of that is that these similarities are like, they're quite absolute. And that is what makes these things quite interesting, I think. Uh, do you care, uh, Luke, to tell us maybe something or to, to how to say, to, to, to clarify what the position is of drawing a work on paper uh, in your oeuvre, let's say, in relation to the paintings, oil paintings? Well, uh, it's, a, to it's it a totally together? different position. I mean, unlike Marlene Dumas, who mixes in her shows paintings and drawings, because a lot of the paintings have to do a lot with the drawings. Mm -hmm. I never do that. I actually tend to keep that separate in terms of the importance of both mediums, not uh, to put them into a wrongly, for me, that's a personal point of view, in a bad juxtaposition. I think uh, every work of art and every medium in its own right has its own existence, I mean, and its own purpose and when used rightfully, also has its own signifier. Uh, and so, I mean, there are people can make films that are very painterly, why not? I mean, so, but it is a specific choice. And unlike some other people that like to mix that, I think it's really important just not to do that. I mean, just to make very specific about those things. And that is actually also something which is, uh, yeah, it's a sensitivity, basically. I can't put it in any other way. Sometimes your works on paper uh, are turned into paintings. Sometimes works of paper comes after the paintings, and probably most of the works on paper never make it to a painting. Yeah. How does that work? Yeah, as you say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, sorry, I have to pee. Really, I really have to pee. So. <laughs> Excuse me. Continue. We continue. So, uh, what do you think, think so far? I mean, time is running too fast, I think. Uh, I still have a number of questions I would like to ask uh, uh, Luke. Maybe you have uh, any? Is it correct? Do you? Is there? Are there questions or comments? Yes, in a moment? Good. And, uh, yeah, how should we continue? What do you want to uh, know from him? What you want? What shall I ask? <laughs> um, I have things to ask. Uh, I mean, uh, I, yes. Maybe um, I can just expand on that. What's sort of being discussed just then about drawing and painting? Um, because I was going to say that these paintings feel in their sort of spareness, kind of influenced by that um, indelibility of drawing. Um, maybe. Well, uh, sorry, my, uh, uh, your language is not so uh, foreign to me, but sometimes I don't understand so well. Can you say it again? Very simple. No, sorry. It's, it's that um, the, the indelibility of the order. In, 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 like, um, you can't erase it. It's like you right. Oh, the, the, yeah. Oh, how it filters into the painting. Yeah, because it's oh, great, like yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, I will ask, and if, uh, if I uh, don't represent your question correctly, you will please, Some, something else? Um, it would be good to talk a little bit about um, how René Daniels, his works on paper, compared to the um, paintings. Okay, yeah. all right. But I, I mean, it's just, it would be good to see what yeah. he works with. He worked with René Daniels, right? Sorry? He worked with René Daniels in Sorley, like, some <coughs> Yes, in the 90s, yes. So you have quite a bit of 
quite a strong relationship to that, that body. I mean, yeah, I do. You talked about the relationship with the drawings, with the paintings, because I'm very aware when I see when I done those paintings how strong the pigment is. Right. It's very, you know, real hit from the colour. And then and in the, paint, in the, the paintings here on the paper, it's, it's much more diffused. Well. Right. Right. Well, uh, for me personally, it's, it's a sort of like discovery, uh, not exactly a discovery, but sort of like a discovery, his, his work on paper. And uh, I totally uh, agree with you. It's, it's, much, it's, it's, it's much more fluid, right? It's, it has a sensitivity, maybe a touch, that uh, his uh, paintings tend not to have. And I think that is actually something that has been extremely uh, influential, especially in, in the like uh, Dutch, Belgium, context, this kind of flatness, you know, this extreme pragmatics, let's say, you know. Much better. Uh, much better, right. Yeah. Okay, uh, and uh, just to say, tell you one thing, I mean, for me it has been extremely um, touching and memorable to install uh, a show of his together with him and somebody else who unfortunately is also handicapped now, I mean, Bart Kassiman, unbelievable uh, how many people have a bad fate. Um, I don't remember when it was. Sometime in, when was the show in Bern of René Daniels? In uh, 90, uh, no, 87. 87. 87, 87, right, 87. It was a very interesting moment, and it was a moment first where um, we still could afford to bring many paintings, you know, because it was everything, everybody was enthusiastic, and was not so expensive, and insurance didn't uh, play a role, etc., etc. So we had a lot of paintings in the uh, Kunsthalle in Bern at that time, and uh, I remember very well, three days, we, we were moving around the paintings, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, until at the end, for the opening, it was clear that the show would be focused on these uh, exhibition spaces and not the figurative narrative uh, work anymore. And that was really the watershed. 87, that was the watershed. We decided this is the work. This is what the work is going to be. Very interesting. I mean, I have been a curator for 25 years. Now, finally, my social service is over. And, uh, and um, I, I'm very critical of, of this profession of curating and I, I think it's quite disgusting. Uh, however, sometimes, in such a case, it, is, it, it brings out something, you know. Or, and again, in this case, you know, and I think this is a, an institution that's almost a non-institution, and there you can do things again, you know. I don't know if something like this would be possible in a uh, serious museum. Um, well, it's, it's, not, it's not a museum, it's actually an exhibition space, so. Uh, there was one question uh, 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 taking us back to the relation between uh, work on paper, let's call it drawing, or, although technically speaking it's not drawing, but we understand what we mean, and this is drawing room, uh, so we can talk about drawing, even though it's not drawing. And you, you made a point uh, um, talking about uh, work on paper, and you, you, you talked about the in Delivability, that you cannot erase it, that you cannot change it. And the question of this gentleman was, if I understood it correctly, how does this, this specificity of work on paper, how does it filter into your painting if you'd make a painting <coughs> after well, that kind of drawing? I mean, do you keep that or is it going to be solidified or what is going to happen? Well, I think in order to answer the question that of course, the drawing will inform the painting in a very weird way, but there is also a misunderstanding. There is a big difference between a painted line and a drawn line. Uh, it took me a while to understand that, and it was only in 85 that I was able to enlarge a drawing into a painting, like literally enlarge it, in terms of copying the the pencil lines, the ballpoint lines, and the ink lines, basically. And I found out that it was a totally different sensation than the drawing itself. Because the painted line, and Velasquez will learn you that, can also be shadow. It can be the outline of things or the numb painted line. 
So it is, there is a big difference, not only because of the fluidity, but just because of the physicality of the whole shell, which is uh, an interesting point. And so there is, therefore, yet again, the element that it informs, but it disinforms at the same time. It's a very ambiguous constellation, if you understand what I mean. Um, look, uh, looking now uh, with more or less the same question in mind at the work of um, of René Daniels, how would you how would you uh, talk about in that case about the relation between painting and drawing? I mean, I, I was just saying that for me, as far as I'm concerned, his painting is specific in the sense that it's often extremely flat. It doesn't build up. It's really flat, and it it uh, it even generated a Dutch school of I, I, think, I think in terms of René Daniels, uh, I mean, there's the one work of the shutters, you know, over there in the corner. And I'm half Dutch, so I know very well what Holland is about. To live there for me would be like instant death. So, but in terms of organization, that's about it, you know, those shutters. And I think René Daniels, as even Mondrian, has been largely misunderstood in their own country. I mean, they did, once did an inquest that the people that liked abstract art initially liked it, would be Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a sort of misunderstanding. But I think in terms of the, 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 the watercolors that René makes and the way they were assessed in the trans avant-garde, because that's where he sort of like grew out of, into something specific, I say. And even the link with Marlene Dimar is quite uh, yeah, clear in terms that they understood uh, the surface of the painting as a flat space. Right. And they also understood it as a fluid universe, whereas I don't. You don't? No. No. Uh, in, in your painting, uh, for instance, the breast stroke is very often very important. It's shortened, and it's also about the element of, uh, yeah, it, it, it's a diff different take on what could be real or not, I think. And so there we differ in a very, 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 very big way. And in that sense, Rubleski is quite interesting because what is interesting with Rubleski is, as I said, the inertion of the image. Right. The element of uh, freezing imagery, which is, I think, quite interesting. For me, it's really important, and this is a personal uh, sort of opinion, that uh, the imagery I make should not make you think about noise or music, or the sound of music, for that matter. So it should be silent. It's a predominant uh, preposition. Silent in terms that silence can also be filled, you know, it can be full. And I think that is quite predominantly uh, the fact because of where I come from. It's, it, it is, I come out of a region where we sort of like virtually have painting as something as genetics. So, I mean, you have the luck to live in a city where you have one of the most, my preferred painting, the Arnold Phoenix of Jan van Eyck, which is traumatizing, talking about the trauma, coming back to the beginning, that's a fucking trauma. Uh, so, I mean, because this guy had a motto which was called, if I can, which actually means like, I have a great deal of humility, but behind it, I also have the most humongous ambitions. And he actually, still working under the cloak of religion, because that was everything, knowledge, by heightening the idea of what was real, got away from the mimetic imagery of Christianity and was the first conceptual artist. It's not fucking Leonardo da Vinci, it is Jan van Eyck. So I rest my case. That, uh, so just, you lost from the beginning which is insane, basically. And so that's maybe a difference between the Dutch as an entity, before they were Dutch, <laughs> and the entity where I come from, which is an older entity. 
and gray skies and luminosity. Okay, uh, we went, we came back to the trauma. That's a nice circle, it's a nice structure. Uh, Luc rests his case and uh, we open it to the floor. The lumen, yeah, you're talking about luminosity, Luc. Um, you always talk about trying to bring in light into your... Yeah, I think that, 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 that's what I say in terms also with, even Jan van Eyck in terms of the, trying to paint a shadow, it's a non-color. It's a very difficult thing to do. It's also a sort of like non-space, basically. But what's interesting is that if you live under gray skies with a translucent element, you have a different sense of what shadows do. If I would live in Spain or LA, it would be a different ball game, I suppose. So in that sense, it is interesting. I mean, it has an impact. And it also creates a certain element of depth, which is a pictorial depth, which is, although illusionary or perceived as such, real. And that is what is the juxtaposition with the whole idea of a construction of the Renaissance and all these Italians. So that's where, I mean, it's also interesting to see that when Peter Sheldew contacted me, when he had to do a piece about the, in the New Yorker about the restoration of the Lamb of God, he, he had to admit that he virtually didn't know a lot about Flemish primitives because the Americans just started with the Italians. So uh, they forgot a large part of what the pictorial story is actually about. And that is a point which is an initial point in terms of Western image building, basically. Yeah, I wanted to ask about the trauma, because uh, that came up as like a remnant of a previous conversation you had, maybe. What's trauma got to do with it? With what? With this. Why was that? Oh. Part of the conversation. Well, Wublewski, uh, 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 he starts seriously to paint in 48. That's uh, four years after uh, the end of the Second World War. He uh, moved in '44, I think, uh, with his family from Vilnius to Krakow, entered the, uh, no, in '45, entered the art school. He witnessed, uh, he witnessed as a, uh, I don't remember, 14 year old or so, his father dying during a Nazi search of the family home. And uh, the first serious works that he made are these execution works. So if that's not a trauma, I don't know what a trauma is. And there's a second trauma in uh, Wroblewski, which is that uh, I mean, at one point then in, in 50, because he was, he, he, he was, he did have a socialist agenda in uh, post-war uh, Poland, you know, under the Soviet influence. Um, so for five years he painted socialist realism, really straightforward. And then uh, came what uh, Luc was addressing, you know, the death of Stalin in, in 53, the secret uh, speech of, uh, of Khrushchev mm -hmm. revealing the, the crimes of Stalinism. And again, a world completely disassembled for this man, you know, because he didn't know to, what to do anymore. I mean, he had lived, I mean, he had found a way how to deal with the memory of the Second World War and of executions and this stuff. And then suddenly it turns out that he cannot continue that way. So there's a second trauma. That's it. I mean, this is, in the case of Luke Teumanns, I don't know if it's, I mean, I can say it, I think, because it's published uh, very often. Uh, there's a family story, there's a rift. I said trauma is a wound, right? There's a rift in this family. One, let's say, on the left and the other on the right. This is, this is, is uh, I mean, this is formational. And then for René Daniels, as far as I can say, it's the realization that uh, you may feel obliged or you may feel, or maybe looking at history, um, uh, compelled to do something serious, but you find out, reading Baudelaire, for instance, you read a poem and it's called the Venom Muse, the muse that is up for sale, it's a prostitute. 
the artwork in the 20th century has turned into a commodity. It's not serious anymore. It's not, you know, it's, it's, it's phony. And then you have the painting of, of Luc Teumanns, of this guy, who disguises as a monkey and pretends to fly. I mean, what can you do? I mean, there, there's not more phoniness imaginable, almost. This is traumatic, I would say. I mean, this is wounds with which somebody has to live and deal. And artists, as I said before, don't develop a neurosis. They make beautiful paintings. Executing painting, that is what I said yesterday in my address. Executing painting. They make painting, and at the same time, they do away with painting. And that takes me back, back to the idea of the blue, as uh, Luke has explained it. I was interested that earlier on, Luke said something like you go on too much about the trauma or whatever, that suggested that you have a somewhat different viewpoint on that between you. Yeah. No, it's just, it may, may not be such a different point. It's just that I think my case, it's, uh, I mean, in his case, but it could lack some kind of humor in a sense. Uh, <laughs> so it is just the element that I don't think really anybody can afford to be really cynical. I mean, you can't pay for that, can you? But you can have a sardonic sort of undertone which makes it a bit more livable, basically. That's it. I mean, it's just that lots of things and lots of coincidences are cruel and funny at the same time. Well, that's what this wall and, is and, and that's is what, about. what Nico is about, the flying monkey, who is just actually just a still or a sort of take that was made in terms of a tryout for uh, the, the movie The Wizard of, the, uh, Wizard, Wizard of Oz. And it's also a painting, and it is also a watercolor or a gouache. I also painted Judy Garland because, and I showed it in London that phrase, because she died in London in a hotel room when she was actually putting all the clothes on her kids because they couldn't afford the hotel rooms anymore and had to change from one hotel room to another, which is quite tragic and funny at the same time. Mm -hmm. Can you, uh, for also the people in the back to understand, if possible? Uh, can you explain what is the trigger for your work? Uh, is it from your own experience or other people's work or ideas or concepts? For all of them? Uh, well, I think um, the basic element, and I said that way back, is violence. Violence? Yeah. Violence is an interesting concept. It can be quite abusive. It creates a great deal of imagery. <coughs> Happiness doesn't. So in that sense, it's a highly productive uh, machinery in terms of making imagery, basically. And it is predominantly violent. For me, the art world is actually war, basically. Put it that way, in a very military way. You know. So your engagement is with the art world, whereas the other two, they're politically motivated. What? The other two artists were, are politically motivated. Well, I, the statement I made was quite political in a sense, but, I, I don't, but first of all, I don't really agree with the fact that any art form could be political from the start, then it would be propaganda. I think art world can have a political stance at a certain given moment in time, that's something else. The multi-layeredness of art is a very important place to keep. I mean, so that sort of like makes your question a little bit, I don't know. No, I mean, it's like asking somebody, what is art? I could actually answer you by, art could be something like I could make, and you could see that I made it. It would be quite a stupid, but an interesting answer. See? <laughs> I just wanted to bring something up that seems 
Well, there's something biogra biographical. Uh, I think in '47, he uh, made a trip to Holland two years after the war, and he saw uh, he saw Mondrian. He visited uh, uh, Constant. Uh, there's an um, there's a yeah, entrance, uh, what do you call it, a ticket signed by the uh, director of the Stedelijk Museum, who was Sandberg at that time. You know, imagine a museum director had to sign the ticket for free entrance of a Polish artist. Probably he said at the, at the uh, desk, you know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm coming from Poland, can I have a free entrance? So the museum director signed it. Um, so he, he did uh, have this like um, encounter with Montreal exactly. But there's another thing, which is that um, after the war in Poland, you have a very uh, strong and interesting and uh, painful negotiation between the idea of modernism and the idea of socialist realism. Yeah. And he is between both. And that is his tragedy, this guy. You know, he is going towards the modernism, and, but then there's a concern with the reality, with the memory, with things that have happened. But at first, at least, he cannot really convince himself to go, uh, I mean, to follow the agenda of socialist realism. So he makes all kinds of strange uh, negotiations, let's say, you know, and it, I, I, I totally agree with you. I think you saw it completely correct. Uh, his work loses in the moment where he decides for one of the both sides, you know, for mm. five years, out of whatever, who knows. So he really paints socialist realism. It's not great, I think. No, he wanted to fit in at that point, but yeah. Well, maybe, I mean, who knows, you know, it's not really clear. It's very difficult. I mean, you die at the age of 30, nobody's interested in you at that, until that point. So nobody takes notes. So we don't know. M mm. Many things we don't know. Yes, I have a question for um, You talked about the article being uh, a war zone. Mm. And uh, I wonder if, if you think it's possible today to make uh, art paintings that has a political stance. And if you go that way, how would you do it? <laughs> well, but the, in fact, as I said, I mean, and I said, there is life is politics. I mean, every human transaction is politics. I mean, that is a fact. Art, therefore, is not. It's, a, it's not that it's a subliminal point of the perception of what being there could be. But I mean, it's just that what art could do, and even a painting could do, uh, or any artwork could do, to a point that depends how it is uh, positioned can make and have a political stance at a certain given moment in time. If we look at the very first painterly expression of that, it would be Goya. Goya who made the May paintings in order to save his neck, basically. Because of course, he had a relationship with the French invaders, portrayed some of them, but still were working for the king. So in order to, when this all ended, in order to save the whole shit, he made these two paintings, which is the assault by the Spanish to the French uh, troops and, of course, the repercussions of it, which is one of the most amazing, I think the most amazing painting in, in terms that it actually shows the old master turning into modernity. And still to this day, I think Goya is one of the most annoying artists to begin with. That's why I like him. I don't totally understand it. And that 
has a political stance to it. But much more coming out of the idea of isolation and the individual than something else, which is really a more remarkable point. And so I think this is, this is what uh, could be perceived as, 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 as making a stand or making, uh, engaging into the imagery by doing it or not doing it. I mean, by whatever purpose you could be, it would be profuse in terms of, as I said also, Goya was also like, taking covering his back, basically, by doing that. These paintings were also never shown. They were shown much later. So they were, they, they were never shown. They were shown to the public much, 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 much later. And the important element of the X, this side, in the entirety of Goya's work which is, you are not really allowed entrance, which I find fascinating. So, there are many ways to come to a, 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 an idea of, when I, did, when I did the Belgian Pavilion, for example, it, I, I, after that I was perceived as a political artist, which is totally stupid. I am not a political artist. I don't think anybody's a political artist. It's not enough to go to the wall of a gallery and put like politics, equals art. That's really stupid. It's a bit more layered than that. It's a bit more complicated than that. And luckily so, I'd say. Because if it wouldn't, it would be one big generalization. And uh, it's also interesting to know that I've been fighting like more than a quarter of my life against politicians who are not interested in culture at all. And so that, 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 that's an amazing, an amazing fight, which you could also call political, but in the other way around, basically. So that's how I think you should position it. I didn't really understand three quarters of what you actually asked. Sometimes, like when you, your the space in your case mm -hmm. feels deliberately slightly removed from a, from a real space or a real reality. So there's some kind of interrogation of what that the film is presented or the photograph is presented. And then in someone like Jan van Eyck's painting, partly because the way they're laid out. Although they're very detailed, very elaborate, they don't feel like a, like an actual space. And whether in your own practice you looked at the way that those Flemish masters have constructed the image, and that would have formed your own use of space in your paintings, or whether that's more well, I think I think partially you're right in terms of uh, the idea of how the element of claustrophobia could be uh, a picture. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. So. Maybe you can just say one thing, uh, look about the um, importance of the wall drawings, paintings that you've made. This is, um, you've made many in the past. Just yeah, I, I, I made, I made this. So far, and Ulrich is actually going to work on that too. Uh, we're going to make a publication about the ephemeral part of my work, which is mostly these wall paintings or wall drawings or whatever that uh, were just made for the duration of a show. And which I think is really interesting because it's, uh, it's uh, you can actually technically reproduce anything. But in terms of painting or drawing or whatever, you can go much faster 
there are no boundaries. I mean, with the technical device, you are bound to pixels and to all that shit. But in painting, you're not. You can paint as big as you want. It's really amazing. So it's such an old medium, but it's so effective. And in that sense, I always thought that wall paintings were fantastic. I also never had a problem like when I would do a wall painting, like I would do, did it a couple of years ago in Dresden, that there's a film crew of people filming it. I just don't, it's, it's just very public. And very weirdly, I mean, if I have to paint on canvas, I can't, which is really a weird sort of fetishistic element that I cannot really explain why that is, I mean. So, uh, in that sense, it's, it's a body of work that, uh, that should be recorded and should be to put into a book and should be put into a sort of document or be documented because it has a value of its own. Ne especially the fact that it just disappeared, which I think is insanely interesting. And, uh, yeah, so that, and this is part of that. So, it's, uh, that's a sub story actually on top of the two shows of Poznan and the one here in the drawing center. Thank you. Well on that note um, I'd like to thank um, and Ulrich very much for the conversation. And um, just to say that there will be a catalogue produced um, in the middle of July and we can take your name if you're interested in, in ordering one in advance. And um, Thank you for coming along, and yeah. thank you very much. Thank you for coming.